Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campion Show, coming to you from right here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news and all sorts of good things. And ladies and gentlemen, we are joined on this great day by one Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, how are you doing today, sir? John, I, you know, the news we're going to talk about on the show, if true, has made me a very, very happy boy. Oh, really? And why? Well, if it's true. If it's true, yeah, we we do have uh, we have a number of things we're going to talk about here. Uh, but listen, let's get into it here, shall we? Here's how today's show is going to go. We have uh, not a lot of topics to talk about here today, guys, because... Well, there wasn't a lot of news coming out of the world of Hollywood yesterday, being the holiday that it was. So there wasn't a lot to come out. By the way, I just have to say, if you guys detect, if you happen to catch, and maybe, you know, uh, are suspicious maybe that, maybe it seems like John's not in such a good mood. Uh-oh. I wasn't going to say anything. Maybe. I wasn't going to say it. Is it, is, it, is it just us, or does it seem like John's in not such a great mood today? You guys would be forgiven that um, you don't know, because I don't talk a lot on the show about it. It's certainly not as much as, as I talk about my love of Star Wars, but I am a lifelong bleed blue and white Toronto Maple Leafs fan. The Toronto, to put this in context, oh, you oh, laugh. Sad. You laugh. I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry. My Toronto Maple Leafs have not been to the Stanley Cup Finals, not just not won the Stanley Cup, but have not been to the Stanley Cup Finals the entirety of my lifetime. From the moment I was born to this very day that we are talking on the show, the Toronto Maple Leafs have never even been to the Finals. Rob, the Toronto Maple Leafs have not won a playoff series, a single playoff series, in 17 years. Uh, forget to get they haven't won a playoff series in 17 years and then last year was looking pretty good i mean they weren't going to win the cup but they they looked good trounced in the first round again no series win so then this year oh rob this year was the year this oh. year was the year i didn't talk about it much cuz i didn't want to jinx anything i you know i you know whatever and they go into the playoffs to play their historic arch rivals, the Montreal Canadiens. They go up three games to one in the series. Three games to one. And you're figuring it's over. Well, then they lost game five. And suddenly it's three games to two. And then in game six, they botched a stupid play in overtime and lost in game six, so now it's three games apiece. So it's all right, they're going home to play in game seven. They're going to win their first playoff series in 17 years, maybe the first time in my lifetime. This is a team that's good enough to get the Stanley Cup final. And they choked. They choked again. The Toronto Maple Laughs choked again. And somebody sent me this meme. It's uh -oh. true. Toronto Maple Leafs in the Stanley Cup, social distancing since 1967. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and you know, when you're somebody like me. That's a great meme. It is. When you have an unhealthy balance of your sense of self-worth tied into a stupid sports team. And you realize they've sucked their entire your entire life, which tells you something about your own sense of self-worth, I suppose. Oh, man, I don't drink. But if I was going to drink, last night was the night I was going to drink. Oh, my God. Last night was almost the night I took up drinking. I I can't. Like, you don't even know how distraught I was. Like, I actually contemplated just canceling all shows for the rest of the week. That's how distraught I was. But, yep, the Toronto Maple Leafs continue their age-old, proud legacy of suckage. F you, Toronto Maple Leafs. There comes a point, Rob. There comes a point when you invest your love and your passion and your fandom 
into something and it just that that object of your fandom just continuously disappoints you and fails you and fails you i guess this is how the snyderverse fans feel anyway so it just constantly disappoints you disappoints you by the way i'm joking it's just having some fun uh i i ah! robbed my whole life and then 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 sorry i'm going off on this today guys just let me vent for a second just get, give me this outlet give me this for a second then rob some freaking edmonton oiler fans had the audacity including a very good friend of mine had the audacity of getting on Twitter to, you know, to convince, oh, you know, John, I totally know what you feel like as an Edmonton Oilers fan, you know, because, you know, they just got knocked out of the first round as an Edmonton Oilers fan. And I'm like, dude, in our lifetimes, the Edmonton Oilers have won five Stanley Cups. So you don't know. Don't pretend that you know. As you can tell, I'm very distraught by all this. Anyway, it's time for us to move on. Rob? Uh, we have a number of things to talk about here today, uh, but mostly we're going to focus on one main topic, and then what we're going to do is save the rest of the show to take your live comments and questions. And that's what we're going to do for most of the show today, is taking your live comments and questions. However, we do have one thing to talk about here that is pretty significant, and that one thing is this. You know, Rob, as we are starting to move out <laughs> of the pandemic era, as we are, and, and that's us fully acknowledging that we understand there are places in the world that are still very, very much dealing with this in a very serious level. We acknowledge that. We recognize that. But for where we live right now, we, we are transitioning into a post-pandemic era. Right. We're not there yet, but we're, we're, we're in the transition now. And we're seeing good things happen. You know, we have seen theaters reopen. Big movies are coming back to theaters again. Quiet Place just made almost $60 million over its uh, Labor Day weekend uh, run. <clears throat> you know, the, the box office itself had a $100 million box office. Now, one of the big uh, pieces of collateral damage, if you will, coming out of the pandemic as far as how it's affected the movie industry was the theater chain Arclight, including the incredible, iconic Cinerama Dome. Arclight Theaters and Pacific Theaters announced that they were closing their doors for good and they were going out of business. Rob, this was hard because for anybody who's ever lived in the L.A. area, the Arclight cinemas are a staple of what it means to be a movie fan. You know, a lot of people, Quentin Tarantino goes to the Arclight. That's that's where he goes well, you know, when he's not watching, you know. His throwback films at the New Beverly, he's going to the Arclight to watch the new blockbusters. A lot of Hollywood people, that's where they go. It's the prime theater down there in Hollywood, that and the Cinerama Dome. Now, another one of the very nearly uh, casualties of war of the whole pandemic was also AMC Theaters. AMC Theaters nearly bought it. They were able to stay alive. They got a lot of investment, got poured in. They sold off a lot of things. They made some deals. They were able to keep the lights on, despite the fact that they laid off nearly 30,000 people and thought that was a good pretense to give their CEO a $9 billion bonus or $9 million bonus. Uh, yeah. But anyway, I won't go into all that again. But, Rob, now those two stories are interceding because it seems that AMC Theaters has just done another stock sale, so they divested themselves of almost 2% more of their stock. But in doing so, they have raised $230 million for what they call, they need that $230 million for what they are calling strategic acquisitions. Specifically, they call out the Arclight Theaters and the Cinerama Dome, including some Pacific theaters. Let's read some of this. This comes to us from the good folks over at Deadline. Uh, let's read a bit of this. Uh, theater chain AMC Entertainment said early Tuesday that it has agreed to sell 8.5 million, uh, million shares to Mudrick Capital Management, raising $230.5 million in cash that it will use for acquisitions. The equity was raised at a price of approximately $27.12 per share. Proceeds from, this, from the share sale primarily will be used for the pursuit of value-creating acquisitions of additional theater leases, investments to enhance the consumer appeal of AMC's existing theaters, and deleveraging the company said uh, given our scale experience and commitment to innovation and excellence amc is being presented 
with a highly attractive theater acquisition opportunities. We are in discussions, for example, with multiple landlords of superb theaters formerly operated by Arclight Cinemas and the Pacific Theaters, said CEO Adam Aaron, who's, of course, about $9 million richer, thanks to laying off 30,000 people. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. Rob, this is interesting because, you know, when they said that this, the, cine, the Cinema Dome and the Arclight uh, was going to be shut down, you and I both yes. said that, you know, somebody's going to come in here. Who was the big question? Because all the theater chains were strapped for cash. All the theater chains were strapped for cash. So we knew somebody was going to come in here and do something. But at the same time, we weren't really clear about who. We speculated may, maybe AMC, but AMC was holding on by the skin of its teeth. And now here they come out. The biggest movie theater chain in the world wants to take over some of the most iconic movie theaters in the United States. And you know what, Rob? This might surprise you. I think this is a good move for them. I actually think it's a good move for them. Part of the entertainment industry, Rob, and I know you talk about this from time to time. Part of the whole thing in the entertainment industry is perception. You know, a lot of it is perception. And for an AMC theaters to come out, make major hundreds of million dollars worth of a deal take over one of the most iconic movie temples. In, because really, Rob, I mean, seriously, the Arclight Theater is very much like a movie temple. It's movie church, man. You walk into the Arclight Theater, and you got the restaurant, the gift shop, the bar, this huge like airport-like arrival sign about movies and their showtimes, this iconic huge clock in there. It just... There's an energy and a feel to that place that is just incredible. And if you're AMC Theaters and you can come out and you can acquire this landmark, this iconic symbol of the theater industry, particularly in Hollywood, if you can come out and take possession of that, that's a win. The other thing perception-wise, though, Rob, is this, is that you know AMC stock has been doing well lately, mm. but now they come out of the gates and saying, okay, yeah, it was a really rough and tumble 2020, but now AMC gets to say, but look at us. Not only are we back, our stock price has gone up and we are expanding. We are acquiring and we are expanding. And I believe Rob, since the announcement that this has happened today, I believe I, let me double check this, but uh, let me see here. Theater stock. I believe their stock has jumped. Uh, since last night, hold on a second, uh, ANC Theaters stock price. That should be able to give it to me here. Yeah, like yesterday when we were doing the show, when we were doing the show yesterday, somebody brought up AMC stock and whatever. I said, well, it's currently at like $26 when I was doing the show yesterday after you had signed off. And as of right now, it's gone up like five bucks. Right now it's sitting at $31.65. So what they have actually done is they have increased their profile by by the deal's not done yet but it looks like what they're moving towards is acquiring the most iconic symbolic theaters and fantastic theaters in all of hollywood the center hub of the movie industry they're creating the impression to the public that we are back we are healthy and we are expanding their stock price is being driven up as a result i gotta say rob i don't know what the ultimate uh future of the of amc is and all that kind of stuff. But I got to say, I think this was actually a pretty good move. Uh, in, in a time where it's like, you know, should you be spending $230 million right now? You're just coming out of it. Sometimes you got to be aggressive. And I got to say, I think this is a good aggressive move. Rob, as somebody who is a big fan of the Cinerama Dome, that's that yep. was your theater of choice that you would go to for all your movie you know, for all your, all your big opening movies, you went to the Cinerama Dome. I was a big fan of, of, of Arclight and some of the Pacific theaters as well. What do you, how do you feel as a fan of those locations about an AMC coming to take it over? And then how do you feel about a potential deal like this from AMC's point of view? Well, I mean, for me, at the end of the day, the only reason to go to a movie theater is to see a film that's beautifully projected that has great sound. At the end of the day, to me, it's all about presentation. 
And AMC has proved that they do have a commitment to presentation with their Dolby cinemas and things like that. The added bonus about the Arclight, and the reason I went there and paid a premium ticket price is no commercials. You knew that you'd get three credit or three trailers, and then they would start the movie. And they had a really good bar and restaurant there. So you could go and have a good dinner and then uh, have some drinks and then go see the movie. And then you, invariably you'd run into people and you'd go, go have drinks at the bar. It was just a great experience all around. And I would hope that – and, and the, the, the industry crowd that goes to those theaters goes there for that particular reason. And I would hope that maybe if AMC does acquire specifically the Arclight here in Pasadena and also in Hollywood and the other Arclights – they should call them AMC's ArcLight, I you know, and, and hopefully keep that premium experience. I love the fact that they might take over the, the theaters at the Grove and at the um, Americana because those are places I also go to. The Americana is really close to where I live, so we would go there. Again, a place to shop, a place to eat, and a place to go see a movie with great presentation. And I hope that they keep those things intact. For me, it's a no-brainer because they are so busy. I mean, the, both the Grove and the Americana, for those of you who don't know, they're like outdoor malls, and uh, they're very busy, and they always, the theater setups are really nice, the screens are big, and they they provide a, a great experience. So AMC would be acquiring an already made theater chain. It's turnkey. They don't have to, like, upgrade the projection or renovate the place because it's already in great shape, all of them. And so I hope they I hope they do it. I think it's a good move. I, I hope that they would keep the the food, the menus, because they've refined that menu over the years, and it's always great, reliable food. I hope they do that, and this could only be a good thing, John, because I have to tell you, you know, it's so weird to have all of my go-to theaters, whether it's the Americana or the Arclight here really close to me or the Arclight in, in um, Hollywood, they're all the theaters I frequent in were gone, just gone. Right. I mean, I could go to the AMC where we saw Fast 9, you know, I could go down there, but it's a little further away and it's not something that, uh, and of course I always make a special trip into Hollywood, but this could only be great. And hopefully if they announce this, all they have to do is staff the place and open the doors. And hopefully they I mean, just they could, they go could back have their old staff. By, yeah. I mean, that's what I would do. I would hire back everybody that still needs a job from the old arc light, the chefs, the keep the menu, keep everything the way it was. I mean, everything about it, even the way you buy tickets, their app, the Arclight app, I mean, all that stuff, they could just turn key it all and turn it back on. Well, I'm sure they would tie in everything to their online AMC portal. I'm sure they would do that. But I agree. Dude, if I could get A-list and go to the Arclight, that would be (gasps) dope. That would be good. But I think you're right. The the key to to keeping this special is if they keep a lot of the things that were unique to the Arclight three trailer maximum have that restaurant open you know have you know they got to be able to keep a lot of that stuff while also incorporating it in amc it's gonna be interesting to see what happens there by the way i just want to mention that adam muhammad sends in a super chat badge in the live chat thank you adam as well as the failed journalist also sends in a super chat badge in the live chat thank you for that man i appreciate that okay with that down guys Let's move on now and start taking some of your live comments and questions. We have a lot to get caught up because of the weekend that happened. We didn't have time to get through all of them yesterday. But let's start getting to your live questions right now and see what it is you guys want to talk about today. We're going to start things off here with Ryan G who writes, Hey, John. I love episode two when everyone is singing Another One Bites the Dust. This is talking about uh, Lucifer uh, and that Les Miserables song when those two were just singing just wow. I mean, yeah, listen, I I am now through Lucifer season 5B. I finished it off uh, last night. It's a very different kind of pace. A couple of very surprising things happened in the final two episodes that I did not expect and I did not see coming. Uh, but yeah, that particular episode, I've seen some people grumbling about the musical episode. I personally got a huge kick out of the musical episode. I really, really, uh, I really enjoyed that musical episode. Anyway, thanks for that, Ryan. Next up, uh, Myra Brito writes, Hola, John. I think it's time for you to expand the John Campy universe or the JCU. We need a Chris Carr food vlog show, a Robert Meyer Burnett movie business commentary show, and an Aaron Cummings being an actor perspective show. Uh, do like Feige and make it happen. Stay filthy. Well, thank you so much for sending that in. 
And you know, it it is it is funny, but let me let me address this seriously for a second. It is funny because I do get a lot of messages from people expecting me and thinking that I have this plan to recreate what I had created at AMC or recreate what I had created at, at uh, Collider, where we're going to eventually get to the point where we're launching all these different shows with all these different people all on the John Campia channel, blah, blah, blah. I mean, Rob, you and I have had discussions about this. You know this. I have no desire to do that. I, I have been there. I have done that. I am very, very happy doing things at the scale. I mean, look, we work our asses off, but still, I like yeah. doing things at the scale. I'm very comfortable. I'm very happy uh, doing things the way I'm doing it right now. Because, you know, I have constantly have people writing in, oh, you know, you should get such and such a person and this person, this person, and then launch different shows. And you should do this. And you should, uh, you know, get a big panel of four people again at a table. I'm like, you know what? I, eh, no. Been there, done that. Kind of moved past it. I'm very happy doing the things the way we do them now. So, I don't know. I know Rob, you got any kind of insight into that you'd want to share? Well, it, you know, it just... <laughs> I mean, I do so many shows already. I, 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 the idea of doing more shows would be daunting. And it, it like I've dreamt my, my channel's called The Burr Network. I want a 24 hour YouTube network with shows that, new shows that are running 24 seven, new episodes. Who's going to do that? Like, yeah. Like, I can't even imagine the amount of time it takes. I mean, dude, I've been doing these midnight shows uh, now. And even those, like you do this, sh I do your show, I do my show, I go stream on various other channels here and there, then I'll do a midnight show, then I got a physical media show, then I got an action figure show, I'll, uh, we do whining about movies, I'm like, I don't even know, I, I, I don't know how much, you know, how much more I can do without, without dropping dead of exhaustion. Yep, there's just only so much you can do and so much that you want to do. But anyway, thank you for writing that. Listen, a Chris Carr. Although I would watch a Chris Carr cooking show. I would to totally, honest. I would totally watch a Chris Carr cooking. I vlog. really miss her. I I love Chris Carr. Yeah. I I love listening to her voice. I I miss her to death. All right, let's move on here. Next up, uh, we've got that was uh, Myra. Thanks for that, Myra. Uh, Sergeant Ward writes, "Hey John, if you had to guess which streaming services uh, services would end up merging with one another, my best guess is Showtime will merge with Paramount Plus and Stars will merge with Apple or, or Amazon. What do you think? I mean, I I don't know. Um, it's it's going to be interesting to see because right now places like Showtime." and stars they actually i read a really neat report about them a couple of months ago rob places like shows time and stars why they are definitely the smaller players right now that they're actually doing very well for themselves yeah. like you know they're with showtime like on there's like five different services you can get showtime as an add-on feature for x amount of dollars you can get it as a standalone thing you can get it as an add-on to one of the different services and they're apparently very profitable like they're not obviously not the scale of an amazon or an hbo or whatever but they're apparently very profitable they make good little shows that take on a real place in the pop culture you know uh uh scene and sure. they make a decent little amount of money and they may be very happy with that now at the same time a place like an apple or an amazon or something like that looks at that where Paramount Plus looks at them and says, Hey, we think if we wrapped you in with us, this will be very, very good for us, and we'll make you an offer that entices you to do it. I I the reality is, Rob, we are probably entering over the next couple of years more amalgamations and more uh, acquisitions and things like that. So I but who it goes to, I don't know. All I know is this Disney right now is not in a major acquisition position. And right. I don't think they will be for a couple of years. That doesn't mean they can't make a couple of small acquisitions, but um, like a, go ahead. Uh, a big news just dropped. Just oh, this minute, just this minute on deadline. They're saying that the new Warner Brothers company will be called Warner Brothers Discovery. Ooh. Well, you that's know on, what? That's on, deadline. That's on deadline right now. There it is right yeah. there. Just Dis dropped 1023 a.m. Breaking news. Discovery says merge company will be called Warner Brothers Discovery. I like it. I do too. 
I mean, look, one of the things that you and I have said for a long time was Warner had to be in there. Warner, but yes. it, but 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 this is not saying that they're rebranding HBO Max. Yeah, to I'm this. curious about that. You know, because that's what I'm. I am actually more interested in what they are going to call their prime streaming service, which right now is obviously HBO Max. What are they going to call that prime streaming service? Okay, that's cool. You're going to call the overall company. Uh, what is it again? Warner Brothers Discovery. Cool. Discovery. Cool name. Good name. No problem with that name. That's great. But I want to know what you're naming the actual service. Uh, and I'm still leaning towards Warner Max. I still think Warner Max is a winner for that one. I don't, I don't know. What do you think about that? Now that they're calling the actual company Warner Brothers Discovery, what does that give you any sort of indication about where you think they might go with the name of actual well, HBO Max? I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I can only imagine. I mean, they've now got Discovery Plus, and they've they're promoting that. Um, maybe they'll keep HBO Max. They a could Warner Discovery Company, but I, I still think they have a branding problem because there's all these different versions of HBO. And I, you know, well, they, they have the been same? getting rid. They have been getting rid rid of of those. Like I, yeah, don't... I, which is good, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. All right. I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm excited. I think Warner Brothers Discovery. I like the idea, the whole notion of discovering new things. I think that's a that was a good way to go. There's something inherently optimistic about that name, and I like it. I like it too. All right, let's get back over to our live questions. This one has come to us from Willow, and Willow writes. Regarding the question about shows you wish got a second season, I admit that I haven't watched Awake. I remember seeing the ads for the show years ago and thinking it looked interesting. But come on, John, the answer has got to be Firefly, Brown Coats Unite. I mean, that's OK. That's another question. So, Rob, I don't know if you were on at the time, but somebody wrote in you know, saying, hey, if you could pick a show that only got one season to get another season now, you know, budget isn't an issue, whatever. You had the power to green light it. I always, whenever that question comes up, you know me, I always go back to that show Awake because I thought it was a wonderful show. It ended on a killer cliffhanger and we never, as the audience, got to find out what was causing this guy jumping between universes. What was making him jump between realities? And we never got the answer to it. We never got it. Firefly is an obvious one. I mean, that I, I don't know that in geek culture circles there has ever been a more important single season show than Firefly. I, I mean, that's that, that's just, I can't think of another one that had the impact that Firefly had, had while only getting one single season. But I never felt like Firefly ended completely unresolved. You know what I mean? Right. And like the awake thing, the entire season was about this question. Why is this detective waking up in different realities every time he goes to sleep and wake up? And just as they're about to answer it, the season ends and then the show gets canceled. Firefly never felt that. And then we did get Serenity, which I think is like the most underrated sci-fi movie the past 12, 15 years. I love Serenity. Um, but I, I'm going to stick with Awake. Rob, do you have anything in your uh, repertoire, in your pantheon of shows that you loved that only got one season and you really wish it had got another? Do you have any that stand out to you? Um, no, not, not, not necessarily. Well, well, yes, yes, yes. I have an answer to this, John. I want one of my favorite science fiction shows of all time is a show called UFO. That was produced between 1969 and 1971. Jerry Anderson, who made the Thunderbirds. It was his first live action show. And then he made Space 1999. UFO only went one season. I would love to have had a second season of UFO. That's one I never watched. I love it. It's. I think it's streaming on Amazon now. I might have to check that out. Guys, I, I mean, I'm curious for the rest of you guys. Do you guys have a favorite show that only got one season and then had its plug pulled prematurely that you if you could have the power to do it you would bring it back for another season whatever it is jump in the comments and let us know i'd be curious to read what some of your picks would be all right let's move on here next up we got suthius who writes february 4th 2018 i remember it all too well i had i uh i had pop up a trailer that had a fight scene in a bathroom 
Uh, that must be Mission Impossible. Uh, one with uh, the characters cocking his biceps before fighting. Never seen such a move. It looked even more badass because of the one and only Henry Cavill. Okay, Henry. So I, I'm assuming he's talking about that Mission Impossible. Yeah. Movie that that bathroom scene fight scene was awesome. It's awesome. It was awesome. And you know what? Okay, here's something. I know this is not what people are talking about, but this is one of the reasons why I like that scene so much. It's one of the things that I really appreciate about Tom Cruise as an action star. A lot of action stars, and Rob, you and I covered a topic on this because a big article was written about it, but a lot of action stars will like have it written into their contract that their character can't lose a fight in the movie. Very reminiscent of what they talked about in um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood when they're, they're talking to Leonardo DiCaprio's character and he says, you know, you get your ass whipped by this guy, so that's all the audience sees you as now is the guy who gets his ass whipped. And so you get a lot of these guys who, like, in their movies, they always have to be invincible. One of the worst offenders of that is also one of my favorite movie stars, Vin Diesel. I love Vin Diesel. I love him. But... Th- him and his characters always being completely invincible is a, a little tiring sometimes. And others can do it as well. But Tom Cruise and that bathroom fight scene in that Mission Impossible movie, Tom Cruise is more than willing to go, yeah, there are circumstances that my character would lose a fight. And in that bathroom scene, like him and Harry Cavill were getting their asses handed to him by that one guy. And it ultimately took both of them to just get out of that thing alive. But they took a whooping. And I love that Tom Cruise isn't afraid to say, yeah, sometimes my characters would get their asses whooped. And I like that about him as a movie star. It just makes me feel like there's more stakes in it. I, I don't know. When you look back at that Mission Impossible movie now, Rob, that whole bathroom fight scene what do you remember most about that bathroom fight scene oh dude, dude it was i mean the flat the, the moment you know i love that kind of thing he does you know it's great but i i really like that movie a lot and i hate to say it as much as my love my james bond franchise i really do think especially the last two films um really sort of supplanted the bond franchise in my mind i mean i hate to say that but the idea of a group of spies going rogue and wanting to change world events and the, the impossible missions force going after them. I mean, I loved, I loved it. I loved fallout. It was great. I mean, what's not to love about that movie from that, that whole parachuting, that, that halo jump. Yeah, sequence was great. Into the, I mean, the whole thing was awesome. And I, I, you know, as far as action movies go, it's delivering it's top tier action filmmaking. It's, I don't know if anyone's delivered to the heights that that franchise is delivering now. All right. Next up, we've got Ronan who writes, like, I like the doc- I like the Doctor Strange, but I'm still waiting for him to break out. It seems that he's been seriously holding back uh, from the fight scene with Ebony Maw to turning Thanos, uh, Thanos's black hole into butterflies. I think is due to his uh, do no harm oath. Uh, what say you? No, no, because there's other fights like the one fight in the first Doctor Strange movie where he's fighting the guy in the ethereal plane while his body is being operated on. Uh, that wasn't Scott Eastwood. That was, uh, who's that guy that, uh, the action guy that everybody loves, but he's never sp- not Scott Speedman guys. Who was the guy who was fighting again? I, I, I can't believe I'm freezing on his name right now. Anyway, you guys know who it is. I'm talking about, um, Scott Adkins. Thank you, Al Johnson, yeah. Scott yeah. Adkins. So he's fighting Scott and, and yeah, there, there was, I never got a sense in, I never got a sense in that at all that or in anything that Dr. Strange has been holding back to try not to hurt anybody. I never, I've never gotten that sense uh, for me whatsoever. So, I mean, you also, it's a fine line you walk because everybody's fate to people, their favorite comic book character should be the most invincible. And one of the knocks on the MCU right now, Rob, I can't remember which website did it, but one of the uh, websites you know, put out this article about uh, like 15 MCU characters who could fight Thanos one-on-one. And it's like that right there is a great example of when things start to get out of control. Like all of a sudden, like you had in the MCU, other alien beings around the universe are like, Thanos is the most powerful being in the universe. Like Jaimon Jaimon Hansu says that in Guardians of the Galaxy, you you can't risk it. He's the most powerful being in the universe. 
But now, like, people say, well, Thor could beat him, Scarlet Witch could beat him, Captain Marvel can beat him, and, uh, you know, if you get a properly raged up Hulk, he could beat him, and then they got this guy coming, this Eternal could beat him, and this, and all of a sudden, like, everybody is so outrageously overpowered that it could, it can, I'm not saying it is a problem, I'm saying if you don't monitor it and reel it in a little bit, it can, I think, become a problem, because, like, everybody's just so ridiculously overpowered. That you have to be, th- and Doctor Strange is one of those characters, Rob, that you could very easily just make him completely overpowered in the movie. So I don't know. How would you address that? Do you think that could be a problem? And if so, if you're a movie exec, how do you keep an eye on that? Well, I, you know, it's that's a tough call to make because it, everybody sort of has different strengths. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to decide, like, okay. You know, there are certain realms where like, like, okay, Dr. Strange is a, is a great example of somebody that has pretty immense power, but when you're fighting alien invaders, does your power work against them the way it would work on somebody who's from earth? Right. You know, like, like, and it, 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 like, look, I think, and we've talked about this before. I think Iron Man in the MCU became way overpowered his magical iron suit could protect him from any kind of shock. I mean, he could be punched by Hulk and it wouldn't hurt him. Like, what does it have inertial dampeners inside that suit? So when he gets flown into a thrown, flung into a wall, he doesn't get hurt. I mean, so they, they, there's very, everybody's playing fast and loose with both the character's powers and, and their abilities and how they go toe to toe with each other. Because theoretically Scarlet, Witch in the comics changed all of reality and made mutants the dominant force on Earth. I mean, <laughs> literally changed reality for every human being on Earth at one time. Yep. Now, how do you combat that? And 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 you can't have a character in the MCU able to do something like that, or can you? I mean, I don't know. It, it just it gets to the point where you have to. There's got to be a little wiggle room in there with suspension of disbelief. But I do agree. That whenever they need a character to be way overpowered, they have them overpowered. If they need an overpowered character to be weak, they do that too. And it seems somewhat inconsistent. All right. Next up, we got Chuck the Mystery who writes, Hey, John and Rob, uh, one of two. Okay, it's official. Cruella has eclipsed Aladdin as my favorite live-action Disney uh, Disney film based on animation. Emma Stone and Emma Thompson and Mark Strong were fantastic. There was even a twist I didn't see coming. Uh, based on the weekend results and the fact that the mid credit scene was clearly setting up a sequel over under 40% that we actually see one. Secondly, do you think the story warrants a sequel based on where the film ended? By the way, I really enjoyed the wrath of man also. Yeah. I, I loved wrath of man, loved wrath of man. Um, okay. So first of all, uh, I enjoyed Cruella as well. It is not, I don't think it's my favorite live action Disney animated remake. Uh, I would put Aladdin in the front of it. I would also, I, I would put the Kenneth Branagh, Lily James Cinderella yeah. ahead of it as well. I l- love that rendition it's of great. Cinderella. I love it too. So good. Um, over under forty percent that we get another one. I'm going to say take the way under, and be, because the reason I would take the way under is this: they spent a lot of money on this movie. They spent 175 million dollars on this movie. Some reports are saying 200. I'm hearing it's closer to 175. But still, that's a huge budget. That's a massive budget for a movie like this. And I don't know why any of them thought it would ever make the kind of money that it would require to get that back. But it made under $30 million in its opening long weekend run. I've heard it has not done great with home premium Disney Plus orders. So bottom line... This thing isn't breaking even. Cruella is not breaking even. And I like this movie. I like this movie quite a bit. But it's it's not breaking even. I I don't think there's any way you do that. I, I just cannot see. Now, listen, I am not working off of any insider information here, Rob. I haven't had anybody from Disney tell me they're not going to do a Cruella, so maybe they will. But from where I'm sitting, it just seems extremely unlikely that they would do another one. Like extremely unlikely. I, I just can't see their, them making a business case for it. So I'm going to guess probably not uh, that we probably won't see another one. Probably not. All right. Next up. And again, it's possible. I'm just saying this is just my speculation. All right. Thanks for writing that in, Chuck. All right. Next up. Um, regarding Superman and Lois, 
Uh, I heard you comment on the events of episode seven. So I know you most likely, uh, you and most likely Rob are caught up on it. I thought the reveal was amazing. Over under 30% that John Henry Irons sticks around for a season two. Uh, eight episodes left this season. I don't know. That is a good question. Rob, did yeah. you get caught up? You got caught up on Superman yeah, Lois? I, yeah, I, I am. And I, I, I don't know either. That's a, that, I mean, I really like the character, the way he's being portrayed. Yeah. So, but I, again, are they going to keep him around? Mm, I don't know yet. No. And listen, I, I'll tell you in, in a world that is becoming more and more difficult to truly catch the audience off guard, that reveal that he's uh, John Henry Irons, that I did not see that coming. I right. did not see that coming at all. I mean, they started to drop hints that he wasn't actually Lex Luthor. I'm like, oh, oh, is he not Lex? But I had in no way, shape, or form did I think he was Steel. I did not think he was John Henry Irons. So that was really cool. Now, they could very well have him serve out his plot purpose for this season, and then he's gone, and then they bring in the things that they need, their MacGuffins, if you will, for the next season. So I'm going to guess 30% that he comes back for season two. What about you, Rob? I, I would that's I think that's a good bet because obviously he he's a great character and um I, I could see that happening. 30% is probably good. All right. All right, next move on here. Next up. Uh, hot quality content writes, Hey John, after years of taking your YouTube related advice, we are finally on track to hit our first 1000 subs. That is awesome. Hitting a thousand is not a small feat, uh, which lets us monetize. I just wanted to say thank you for being a source of inspiration. We would, we wouldn't be where we are today without your shows. Bring on the filthy. Well, that's all. Hey, listen, it's always good to you. First of all, I love it when my fellow fans get involved to do something a little bit, to flex their creativity a little bit, do a blog, do a podcast, do a YouTube channel. It gets you more invested in your fandom and it adds your voices to the conversation. Um, I love that. I especially love hearing when somebody actually is getting a little bit of traction. So that is great to hear. And if uh, we could have been any part in helping you get there, that is just awesome. Thanks for sharing that hot quality content and good luck with the rest of your run, man. All right. Uh, next up, Chicken Powder writes, have you seen the Canadian show Good Doctor about a surgeon with autism? Yeah, that's got the kid actor from uh, uh, Finding Neverland, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it does. Um, anyway, uh, wife started watching it and cries once, sometimes twice per episode. So being a supportive husband, I started watching and crying with her too. Things we do for our spouses. Good show, though. You know what, Rob? I have heard nothing but good things about The Good Doctor. Never seen an episode. I, I don't know why. It's just the previous four just never looked like it was a show for me. But I keep hearing good things about it. Uh, I, Freddie Highmore, I think that's the name of the actor who plays it. Uh, oh, and as a matter of fact, Michael Evans write, wrote in the live chat, Freddie Highmore. So, yes, it is Freddie Highmore. Um, I, it just never appealed to me. I, and I never, ever saw any kind of previews that made me feel like, wow, I should tune into this. But I hear good things. Rob, have you ever checked out The Good Doctor? Uh, I have not. I have not. Uh, and it, I, you know, I don't know if I ever would, but I haven't. All right. Next up, we've got garden variety vagabond who writes in, Hey, John and gang watching the new episodes of Lucifer. And I just got through all of them last night. Just wow. First Aaron's girl. Mazakin was amazing in so many ways. Uh, the writing was just great. The meeting of Daniel and God was perfect. You know, my wife, see you later, or maybe not. Ouch. Yeah. I, I gotta say, I, Season 5B, the second half of season five, you could tell right away from the first episode or two that this was going to be a kind of a different season than the other seasons of Lucifer. Because, Rob, somebody wrote in and said this, and, and they're absolutely right. When you're watching this thing of Lucifer, you can tell that it mostly was being made under the assumption that this was their last season. So they were yeah. just kind of pulling out the stops and doing a bunch of things. And you could kind of feel that it felt like this is a show that is now winding up because they thought this was going to be the last season as they were shooting it. Of course, we now know that they had been uh, at the 11th hour, they signed an extension and now there's going to be a season six, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but still it was very different, but I had a great time with it. I really enjoyed this season. They did some things that were very different. Uh, they did some things that are very cool. They shocked me a little bit in the final two episodes. Rob, I don't. I don't, I mean, it just dropped a few days ago. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch any of the new Lucifer or not. No, I have not. But I, I love that show. 
Yeah, and it's I really like this thing. The musical episode is great. So uh, I agree with you, Garden Variety. I truly, truly agree with you. And yeah, Mazakine has been great this season. She really has. All right, uh, next up, we got Austin Smith. Uh, who says, hey, John, Bo Burnham's new special Inside came out today on Netflix. I found myself laughing like an idiot and then immediately questioning life several times. It was really damn good and hope to hear your thoughts on it if you watch it or not. I, I'll i be honest with you. I have no idea who Bo, Bo Burnham is. Yeah, you do. You I just do? don't know his name. Okay. He's been, in, he's been in a bunch of movies. Like he was in Promising Young Woman. Or, uh, yeah, oh, the Promising actor. Young- yeah, yeah, the yeah, actor yeah. Bo yeah, yeah. He but he's a his, comedian. Is, is was this a stand-up yeah, he's special got a or something? Show. I have a friend named Emily who's obsessed with Bo Burnham. <laughs> she's convinced uh, she should be his wife, and she probably should because she's amazing, but and beautiful. But uh, but uh, yeah, she watched it and wrote me back and said her life is complete now and was gushing about this special. I haven't watched it yet, but apparently it's quite good, John. Yeah, I, I am not familiar with him. I have not even heard of this special, but thank you for putting that on my radar, Austin. Appreciate that, man. I'll keep my eyes open for it. All right, next up, Michael H. Jones. Uh, tips in like $20. Thank you, Michael, for supporting the channel on that level. And Michael writes in, Hey, John, my favorite Lucifer line of all time comes from Season 5, Episode 10. Moses didn't desire this much FaceTime. I loved that line. I loved that line. And I won't say the context of it because I don't want to spoil anything. But when it comes, even Moses didn't desire this much FaceTime. It, yes, it's great. Also, uh, A Quiet Place 2 and Cruella are both very good. Hope you saw the box office numbers. Box office is back. And yes, we did talk about that on the show the other day. And again, a, a tremendous success for A Quiet Place 2. Couldn't have happened to a better movie. This movie is fantastic. Uh, it's going to be in my top 10 by the end at the end of the year for sure. How high? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but that movie was fantastic. Great success. The, overall, the box office had its first $100 million weekend in forever. So that's been great as well. So yeah, all that stuff is good. But I, I am right there with you, Michael. Even Moses didn't desire this much FaceTime. If once you see the context of the show, it works great. I love the line. Thanks for writing that in, man. I appreciate it. All right, next up, uh, Ryan G writes, Hey, John, whenever you read this on Tuesday or Wednesday, and it is Tuesday, um, it was, it is or was my 27th birthday on Tuesday. That's today. Uh, wish me a ha- happy birthday, too. Well, happy birthday, Ryan. May you have a glorious, great day and a glorious and great year filled with triumph and victories along your path all throughout <laughs> the rest of the year. May you have a good one, my friend. And uh, again, happy birthday to you, dude. All right, next up, Clay Woodley writes, I saw A Quiet Place 2 this past weekend, and it definitely is worth a sequel. Let me try this again. Saw A Quiet Place 2 this past weekend. Loved it. Definitely a worthy sequel to the first. Do you think that the film will have legs and be just as successful, if not more so, than the first? Uh, It has some competition this weekend with Conjuring 3. Yeah, and that's one that's kind of flown under the radar, Rob. Conjuring 3 opening up. Again, I don't like the title of the movie. I think it's, even though the trailer's good, the title The Devil Made Me Do It just sounds, I don't know, eye-rolling at best. I am curious about it. I do not know how well this movie will do. I really don't. I, Rob, you could show me a video clip from a week from now, like in the future, and show me a clip say, saying, Conjuring 3, The Devil Made Me Do It, made $8 million opening weekend, and I wouldn't be surprised. And you could show me a clip that says, Conjuring 3 made $40 million opening weekend, and I wouldn't be surprised. I, I honestly, right now, have no idea what the barometer is for, for this movie. I have no sense of it whatsoever. I don't hear a lot of people buzzing about it. I don't hear a lot of people talking about it, but it is The Conjuring. So... <laughs> Back to A Quiet Place. Rob, right now, I don't know what kind of legs movies can have right now. Like, we, we're not out of the pandemic yet. No. You know, you had a great opening weekend, but we traditionally are in a cycle where more and more people are seeing movies in their first couple of weeks anyway, even prior to the pandemic. So when I say I don't know what kind of legs it's going to have, I'm not saying I'm doubting it. I'm saying literally, I don't know. We have no precedent for this. It will be curious. Like 
I think it'll take less than a 60% drop next weekend, which would put it in an acceptable range. So, But I also think it'll be a greater than 50% drop. So I think it's going to be between a 50 and 60% drop. What do you think, Rob? I think that sounds pretty good. Um, but, you know, word of mouth on this movie is really strong. So um, that's true. I, I mean, people are I, I haven't I don't think I've seen a movie that people were that gaga for in a long time. So it might it might have a big hold. Obviously, you know, I mean, I could see it maybe only having a 40 percent drop. Well, that would be great if it did. I mean, that would be huge, obviously. But but I, I, I only base that on the fact that many people are loving life with this movie. So why not? A 40% drop, even pre-pandemic, would have been considered an outstanding set of legs. Yes. So yes. It'll be, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. All right, next up. Uh, John Campion's Fingernail writes, I personally think Sony and Disney have already extended their deal uh, for for a few more movies. We just don't know it yet. I'm almost 100% that if not Spider-Man, Spider-Woman, or someone will come to the MCU, Olivia Wilde hinted back then at something with Feige. Well, I mean, look, there are, we just heard the Sony president, uh, Sony Pictures president, we talked about this the other day, Rob, saying that, oh, maybe we'll see Spider-Man with Venom. Ooh, would it be cool if these guys meet? Oh, we absolutely have our plans, he said. We have our plans. Some of you already kind of suspect it, but it's going to become more clear with Spider-Man No Way Home. And, of course, we broke it down that that could mean one of two possible things. One, that they are going to ex to continue and expand and extend their existing deal with Marvel, so to keep things the way they are. Mm -hmm. Or two... It means, as many people suspect, that Sony is now, that this is the final film, Spider-Man film, under their agreement. Now, there is one more contractual thing where Tom Holland needs to appear in one other movie, but it's not going to be a Spider-Man movie. So this is, Spider-Man uh, No Way Home is the final Spider-Man film in this deal. And a lot of people suspect that with the title like No Way Home, it's basically end with Peter Parker no longer being in the MCU. Peter Parker goes over to the Sony verse and then they start building all their stuff around there. We've already had Venom. We got Venom 2 coming. We got Morbius coming. We got Craven the Hunter coming. We've got uh, Madam Web coming. We've got uh, several projects on the go. I personally think, and Rob, this is not based on anything, but I personally think it is probably the second thing. I personally think what is probably going to happen here is that Spider-Man is just packing up and going back home to Sony. And I'm good with that because Sony has made the best Spider-Man movies. So I'm okay. There's all, they've also made the worst ones, but they've made the best Spider-Man movies. So I'm okay with that. But it could very well be. And Rob, I think it's fair to say that if the plan is that they are extending the deal, then absolutely the person writing in is 100% right. The deal's already done. Yeah, I mean, there, if that's what they're doing, there is no way it's not already signed. Of course, it would be already signed. We just don't know it yet and probably wouldn't know about it for a while. Rob, I know we talked about it the other day, but you've had a little bit of time to marinate on it a bit. Reflecting back on the words of the Sony Pictures president and stuff like that, which one do you lean towards? Do you think it's more likely now that they are going to extend this deal? Because, Rob, this deal has been great for both of them. Yeah. Disney's made money. Sony's made money. I think that when they have had to interact and collaborate on these projects, I think they've delivered some really good, solid Spider-Man movies. But at the same time, Sony is looking at, look at the success we had with Venom, with Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. People are excited about Morbius, blah, blah. Let's get Spider-Man back in here and really build this cinematic universe. I don't know. Which way do you think they're leaning right now? I think they're absolutely going to extend the deal. I think they're also making plans to to combine these universes into one, and I think that um, they can they can get away with that, or either that or they're going to say that the Sony Spider Verse is an adjunct universe, you know, like specifically give it a number the way they have different universes in the Marvel Comics universe. But I think that why wouldn't they extend this deal? It's worked out for everyone, and I think you know what's great about it is I wouldn't be surprised. If Sony makes another Spider-Man movie that's outside of the MCU, that is specifically dealing with their Sony-verse, whether it's Mobi Mo Mobius, whether it's the Sinister Six, whether it's Venom and Carnage, I think they're going to do a movie that deals with those characters while Phase 4 
and phase five continue forward and whatever their long term plan is, because whatever they're doing at the MCU, we don't know yet, but they're they're building up to another Infinity War and Endgame, whatever that is, whatever form it takes. I don't know because it's still early on, but they know and whatever that is. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be exciting, but I think Sony's going to play with Spider-Man in their own Sony Spider-Verse for a while, and then and then it will um, it will uh, and then Spider-Man will return to the MCU. All right, let's see. We're I, I'm sure we're going to find out in the next of couple of months. By the way, John, that's a total speculation. I have no evidence yeah. or knowledge to support that assertion. None. Yeah. But but I think we are pretty firm that it's got to be one of those two things. Yes. And and we will find out soon because, you know, Spider-Man, the movie's coming out in a few months. So yes. and I think we are going to know what the future is going to be prior to that movie launching. So we'll see. We'll find out soon enough. It could be either. All right. Ryan Loner writes, I can't wait for the Ursula movie where we find out her parents were killed by a pair of legs. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, of course, uh, either Float Sam or Jet Sam is turned into what I'm pretty sure would now be Disney's fifth uh, first gay character. Fifth first gay character. Uh, those are the eels, right? Were those the eels? I, I, yeah, I think so. And Anne is constantly trying to get me to watch because I don't think I've ever watched that movie more than once. I think I saw the movie once in my lifetime. I might have to go back and watch it some more. Anyway, thanks for sending that in, Ryan. All right, next up, Jason Espinosa writes, Um... Production has started on Amazon's eight-episode revival of those good Canadian kids in the hall. Dude, I was very excited to hear about that. If you guys, I mean, look, I'm sure, you know, I'm always surprised how many Americans do know about kids in the hall. They are one of, in my opinion, one of the greatest uh, ever comedy troops, sketch comedy troops and stuff like that. There has ever been a bunch of good Canadian boys. I actually did a, a show with one of the guys from kids in the hall for a little while. Um, but at, at any rate, I love that these guys are back. These are the Daves I know, I know. These are the Daves I know. Only a few people will know, will know that reference. But I'm very, very excited. Rob, I, I don't know how big it was in the Pacific Northwest. Did you guys ever watch Kids in the Hall? When, like, at, yeah, at all? You know, people did, you know, absolutely. We have, we have a very good sense of sketch comedy. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm no, very excited they they're back. Very excited that they're back. Absolutely. I cannot wait to see what they've got. All right. Alan uh, Hi writes, uh, is The Quiet Place the first truly profitable movie of the pandemic era? That's a good question. I, I want to say that the first truly profitable movie of the pandemic era was uh, Godzilla versus Kong. Uh, let me just go and check it out because I know I believe it hit 400 million uh, at the worldwide right. box office. So let me just, ah, damn it, Fandango and your pop-up ads. Um, okay, so, and by the way, Dragon 10 sends in a Super Chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Dragon 10. So, yeah, I mean, hell, look at that. Uh, the movie made $435 million at the worldwide box office. Uh, and I believe, Rob, we did our mathematical breakdown before, and I believe we said it needed to get around 395 390 395 yeah. to be profitable and if it has indeed uh hit 400 and nearly 436 million dollars that means it is in the not only profitable range but tens of millions uh profitable range so uh right now i think we can say that godzilla versus kong was the first truly uh profitable not massive like, oh, we made $800 million in profit. No, but it was clearly profitable, so I, I think we got to go with that one. All right, uh, next up, Canadian Batman writes, best of luck for the game tonight. Obviously, he wrote this in just before the game last night. Did not go my way, Canadian Batman. Did not go my way. Hence is the story of the life of a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Doesn't go our way. All right, uh, Teske writes, Hey, John and Co. Just wanted to tip in and say uh, and say tell you how appreciative I am of you guys constantly uh, getting me through these work days. Keep on the filthy. Well, thank you so much for that, Teske. You know, Rob and I talk all the time, uh, both on camera and off, about how amazing it is that we get to come along and be that that so many of you guys allow us to come along and be a part of your day. Whether it's you just sit down to watch the show. Or you've got the show on while you're working. It helps get through your day. Maybe you're you're at work. You pop on the podcast. You listen to on the podcast. 
just we are constantly getting Rob and I both get messages from people all the time about uh, the fact that they just have us along for them on their day. And we're always amazed by that. Um, and so uh, both Robert and I, I, I think I speak for both of us, Rob, when I say we are very, very grateful, uh, Teske, that you allow us to come along on that ride with you. All right. Uh, next up, we've got Film Love and Bro who writes, Hey, John. So A Quiet Place 2 was not helping my aversion to walking barefoot outdoors. <laughs> nope, certainly would not. Um, haven't they heard of Grip Socks? But it's a really solid sequel and Krasinski showing mastery of his craft. I know part three is assured, but would love to see what else he directs. Well, Rob, you know what? That's... Is part three assured? Is it a sure thing that they're dual part three? Because I'm not so sure that there is. And if they do... I am got to remember, John, it was not the original plan for John Krasinski to direct the second one. It, it right. That was kind of a thing that evolved afterwards, like something else fell through and Krasinski was like, OK, I'll do it. So I don't know if he wants to come back, but I completely agree with Film Love and Bro here, Rob. After seeing what he's done with A Quiet Place Part 1 and A Quiet Place Part 2, I am dying to see him do what what does he do with something else? We know he's got the Quiet Place universe down. He, he's got that. We get we get that. I would love to see Jim Helpert direct a rom com, or uh, or a thriller, or I don't know. It would be neat to see him do something else. Rob, if you had to set odds on this, do you think John Krasinski's next movie is something other than a Quiet Place Three, or do you think the next project he does is definitely going to be a Quiet Place Three? What do you think is going to happen? Ooh, I you look. I think uh, that's tough. I think he'll probably make another movie and then do a Quiet Place three. If he doesn't a quiet, if he does a Quiet Place three, I think he's going to do something in between the two. All right, yeah, a little Christopher Nolan ish in there, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I certainly hope he does. I would like. To, I'd love to see him do something other than Quiet Place. Although I'm totally down for a Quiet Place three as well. But I, I've got to. You know what? Again, I have nothing to base this on. I think there will be a Quiet Place three, and I don't think John Krasinski is going to direct it. Just because, again, he he wasn't supposed to originally direct the second one anyway. I have a feeling he's going to move on, but we will find. I, I could totally see Rob's scenario working out here as well. I could totally see that happening. All right, uh, Terev writes. Um, there isn't enough talk about bloat in movie in movie budgets. Who approves a budget of 175 million for for a Cruella movie? Alan Horn. It all goes to the low budget and high budget movie making and no in between. Not every movie deserves to have blockbuster uh, expectations. Okay. Here's the thing, Tariv. I have talked for many years um about spending in Hollywood movies has gotten out of control. We've talked for many years because Rob, it's, it's, it's systemic. Like people, I would say, you know, blah, blah, blah. Why are they spending this much money? People say to me, well, John, why do you care? It's not your money they're spending because where do you think they pass on that extra expense to? They pass on the extra expense to you and to me. The reason why movie ticket prices and more things are happening continue to rise and rise and rise and all that kind of stuff is because the industry spends more and more and more and more, and therefore they have to recoup more and more and more money to justify it, and ultimately the people that pay for it are you and me. So when people say to me, Rob, oh, yeah, why do you care? It's not your money they're spending. No, because it's all of us. It affects the entire movie-going experience for everybody. Now... Understanding that I said that, and I do believe they overspend on a lot of these movies. It's easy, Rob, because Rob, I think you and I both do this too. It's easy to play Monday morning quarterback. Sure. And say, well, clearly they shouldn't have done this one. Now, look, I, I never thought Cruella was a good idea for a movie. But that being said, how many people said Aladdin was a terrible idea? Remember when they were doing Aladdin and they announced it was going to be Will Smith as the genie? Yep. And ev so, not everybody, but so many people. Oh, this is going to be terrible and it's going to flop and who, who greenlit this and blah, blah. Guess what? It became the newest member, at the time, became the newest member of the Billion Dollar Club. And yep. the movie was great. And I never would have thought that movie would make a billion dollars. 
and a lot of people didn't even think it was a good idea to do the movie. Here's the thing. It's easy for us after the fact to look back and say, well, they were crazy for doing that. Yeah, but people said that about Aladdin too. And it, I mean, you make calculated risks. You take calculated risks. Sometimes it pays off. Sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, in general, Rob, I do feel they should rein in a little bit the spending on these things. Look, unlike some movies that have outrageous budgets and you go, I can't possibly see where that money was spent. When you watch Cruella, it it looks and feels like an expensive movie. It, yeah, it, you can tell that from the trailers. Yeah, it's an expensive movie. I mean, it looks film. really lush, the set design, and I mean, just the amount of extras, and I, it just looks like a really, really lush movie. The question is, though, that I have, I think you're you're absolutely correct. I, I mean, could you have made Cruella for $125 million? You know, <sighs> that's $50 million less. I... I Look, I, I'm of the opinion they shouldn't make a Star Trek movie for more than $100 million. Like, and I think that if you are making Star Trek movies, I, 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 I often wonder, you know, as a producer, we both produce programming, and it's, it's like, I, I mean, it, it's almost like, okay, you're, we're going to give you an unlimited budget to begin with. And I think, well, why not, why not rein it in? Why not, instead of making $175 million movies, why not make $125 million movies? What is that $50 million really buying you? Right. Yeah, no, I agree. Listen, we go back a lot to District 9. District yep. 9 is a visual effects, excellent visual effects, heavy movie, and they made, look, I, I, think, I think the word is they made that movie for around $35 million or something like that. I mean, you there's ways. There's ways to reel it in. But then again, when you have like some of the hottest movie stars in the world, like an Emma Stone, you're going to pay a lot for that too. And and I got to say, some of the CGI in the movie was very, very good. Um, so I get it. But again, it's easy for us to play a Monday morning quarterback about whatever, but sometimes it hits, sometimes it misses. They understand that. It's a business. That means sometimes there's a little part of it is gambling. So we'll see. All right, BK Dan writes, John, I think it's in the title, No Way Home. I think that Spidey's being sold lock, stock, and barrel to Disney. No chance. Uh, I see Disney is about to reveal in joint statement with Sony uh, right before the movie comes out that they have made the deal. I don't, no way. I, I, I mean, Rob, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Why on earth would Sony sell back the rights to Spider-Man? <laughs> yeah. Why would they do it? Why, like, especially when they, their biggest successes, Rob, have been their Spider-Man adjacent movies, their Venom, their Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which won the Academy Award for them as well. They have big hopes for Morbius and things like that. And the new CEO of Sony, well, new, he's been on the job now for a number of years, but the, the current CEO of Sony is very much about the movie business. And the most successful thing they've got is Spider-Man. Why on earth would Sony sell that back? You, they, they would have to be morons of the highest scale because I would never sell that property back. Rob, you would never sell that property back. At least not for an amount of money that is anything short of it would be absolutely ridiculous for Disney to pay it kind of money. You know what I mean? So I just, I do not see that happen. That's why when I look at the scenario about either Sony and Marvel have extended their deal or Sony is just taking Spider-Man back, I see those as the only two viable options. Disney is reeling, Rob, from completing a $71.3 billion acquisition of Fox, followed by 2020, which put Disney as a company in massive peril financially. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. not going to spend $12 billion to buy Spider-Man back. They're not going to spend $10 billion to buy Spider-Man back. And it's going to take numbers like $10, $11, $15 billion for Sony to give them up. Because if you're Sony, why on earth would you give it up for anything less than that when you're having big success and you believe, whether the rest of us believe it or not, but Sony believes they have years of profitable filmmaking in front of them with that character and that IP. I don't see that happening. Rob, I pose to you the question, the scenario that Disney is just lock stock and, and Sony is willing to sell just buying the rights to Spider-Man back. Is that, could that be a feasibility for something that we're going to hear in the next few months? No, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, why, first of all, 
why would Sony possibly want to sell their crown jewel in their franchise cap right now? Why? No reason. I mean, the 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 last animated Spider-Man movie they made won an Academy Award. They're doing another one. You know, you've got Morbius. You've got Carnage. Uh, uh, Let there be Carnage coming out. They're going to do a Craven the Hunter movie. All of these are part of their Spider-Man deal. I mean, the, Sony could live off their Spider Verse if they had to, and they could make movies that'll probably, assuming they're all good. I mean, you could turn it. In, that could be the only business they're in. And it could make them money. They're not going to give that up. Plus, look at the video game side. Yeah. You know, I mean, why would you do that? Rob, it often comes down to like a, a sports analogy that I like to draw. Because what sports fans often do is like they'll be the fan of some basketball team and saying, why doesn't my team trade for and get James Harden and LeBron James? Why don't they trade? They should. Why aren't they doing that? They should do that. Well, OK, that's great. But you have to have something as a team that the people who do own the rights to James Harden and LeBron James would have to consider valuable enough for you to give them in order for, and you just don't have it. You don't have anything that you could possibly give the Nets or the Lakers to get James Harden or LeBron James away from them. You simply don't have it. And whatever amount you do have, you'd be destroying your thing to do. So, like, it's one thing to say we they should just get James Harden. Okay, that's great. Disney should get Spider-Man back. Great. But if Sony is not in the selling market right now, then there's nothing Disney can do about it. So, it, you know, it is what it is. Anyway, thanks for bringing that up, BK. I appreciate that. All right. Let's move on here. Next up. Ben Rayner writes, Hey, John and Rob, happy Memorial Day. I think Spidey will go back. Obviously, uh, Ben wrote that in yesterday. I think Spidey will go back to Sony, but if they do exist in the same universe, uh, but if they do exist in the same universe and Eddie and Carnage is in Frisco, but isn't Scott Lang an Ant-Man character there? I think you meant there as in T-H-E-R-E. -E. Anyway, any chance Paul Rudd cameo uh, or 0%? Uh, I don't know, Rob. Because, look, there have been teases and innuendo for Ant-Man to cameo in a Venom 2 is, that takes away all the insinuation. It's it's now, it's done. That Sony Spider-Verse and the MCU are one and the same. Right. Like, you can tease Michael Keaton and still have some ambiguity. Like, we all think we know what it means, but it's not definitive, right? Well... Paul Rudd yeah. shows up as Scott Lang. Well, then that's it. The discussion's over. I, so I'm going to say I, I'm not expecting to see it, but that would be a game changer. What do you think, Rob? Well, I think that Michael Keaton showing up says the same thing. You know, what's, what's interesting to me about this, I've thought a lot about this, actually, John. When Iron Man 1 came out, I wouldn't have believed a, a Venom or Carnage could, could exist in the same universe. But as the MCU has rolled along after Infinity War and Endgame, and certainly after the new Loki TV series, why not? I, I think anything goes now. And they've the, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has made you believe that Venom and Carnage could possibly exist in the MCU because of the highs that, that Infinity War and Endgame went to. And the wackiness now of WandaVision and uh, apparently of Loki – They've really embraced the entire comic book. Like people, no one's going to say if Venom showed up in a Spider-Man movie, no one's going to be mad about that. They're like, of course, you should have. Bring it on. Because they've made us believe. So the MCU, I think, is at a position now where it can do anything it wants. And they're going to, they're just going to say, yep. I mean, one of the things people ask is like, why, why didn't the Eternals get involved in, uh, in uh, the Infinity War, the end game? Well, first of all, you know, you think about it, like not everybody, something's going on. There's an alien incursion in New York City. The Eternals like, well, the Avengers have that covered. Like, we're not going to, we're not getting involved. Uh, they didn't know Thanos was going to snap his fingers. You know, and maybe, yeah. maybe we will see that that was one of the things that brought them out of, out of, out of, um, uh, it spans thousands of years. So you think they're not going to cover these things in the movie? I bet they do. I bet they have reasons. And, uh, and obviously there's something that's happening in Eternals. We haven't had any indication, like maybe one of them goes rogue, I think. But what if one of the Celestials is coming to judge Earth or something like that? I don't know. 
But <laughs> now saying that, I think that these the, all these characters can now exist, coexist in the same universe. I mean, you know, we haven't gone to w- the West Coast yet. Not really, except with, well, you know, I was wrong because Scott Lang is in San Francisco. But so that's why he would. That's why he would show up. Yeah, there there could be a, a connection. Here's here's the big the biggest problem I see, the biggest hurdle or speed bump, if you will, in the Sony verse and the MCU inhabiting the same reality. Kevin Feige is an absolute control freak, and I say that in the most positive way possible because the only way he's been able to orchestrate and construct this entire MCU is because he has kept a very tight rein on everything that goes on with the MCU, very tight control on what it is. He approves every single blade of grass that happens in a world. He's, he is very much a control freak. I, I have a hard time imagining. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying I have a difficult time imagining that Kevin Feige would be willing to let go of the reins and say, yeah, okay, Sony, the, the movies of Sony does happen in our world too. But now Kevin Feige, that means Sony can do all these things in their movies that Kevin Feige has no control over, and that is now we are supposed to understand what happens in his world. So if Sony decides, and this is a, a, an extreme example, but if Sony decides in Morbius 3 that they want to, in a some big apoc- apocalyptic battle in Morbius 3, New York City gets destroyed. Well, Kevin Feige doesn't want New York City destroyed in his movies. It's not what he wants to have happen. And it, it's just it's just little things like that. That's an extreme example, but I think that's just one of the things that makes it very complicated for the idea of both of them inhabiting the same world. But, Rob, as you've said before, it's all about what you negotiate. If they can come up with a deal that is satisfactory for everybody, maybe it becomes a possibility. Yep. All right, let's move on here. Uh, next up. Corey Everett writes, I love movie talk. I love movie talk too. I still kind of wish I could have gotten my name back. Movie talk. That was my name. Uh, of course, it was AMC movie talk at first. Then it was, uh, um, then it was Collider movie talk for a while. Uh, by the way, I don't think I call, call it out. Brett V sends in a super chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Brett. As does I- iconic reactions also sends in a super chat badge. Thank you, man. I appreciate that guys. Um, I remember I had a meeting with the f- now former owner of Collider, um, he and I got together and, and chatted a couple of times, and and it was and it was good. It was positive because you know I, when I left Collider, it it wasn't all rain. I don't know if you knew this, Rob. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows when I decided no. to leave Collider. Hey, don't me know. neither. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> don't know if uh, people knew that. I you know and anyway. But it was it was really good. The 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 former owner of Collider and I uh, we we had a chance to get together and stuff like that. And we actually even discussed because of course Collider shut down Movie Talk and they shut down all the things that made it special and whatever. And so I remember I had a discussion with him and I said, you know, if because he was still owning. Uh, he still owned Collider at the time. He no longer owns Collider. He's not, I don't believe he's associated with Collider in any way because I believe he sold it all off. But at the time, he was still the owner. And I I, I remember bringing it up. I said, hey, you know, listen, uh, I lament that you shut down Movie Talk. I think you made a mistake shut down, shutting down Movie Talk, but you've shut down Movie Talk. What would you think about me taking my name back? Because it is my name. <laughs> What would you think about me taking my name back? And I got it. I get it. Listen, because at the time, his response, and it was actually totally reasonable. He said, look, there's, even though things are rough right now, there is still potential value in the name movie talk for us that maybe we want to do something with it later. And I feel like it would be, you know, premature of me to just let it go now. He goes, you know, I, I appreciate you asking for it, but I hope you appreciate that it's it's not just something we should give away. And you know what? I While I totally think he should have given it to me and I should have had it back and I should have the name Movie Talk again, I did understand where he was coming from. Like, again, we were just talking about Sony. Why would Sony just give up Spider-Man? Of course you don't give that up. You hold on to it. And they thought at the time that maybe there was some value in it. But uh, yeah, it would be nice to have the name back. I love that name. I love the name Movie Talk, Rob. But uh, yeah, it is what it is. All right, let's move on here. James Argento writes, Tin foil hat theory 
In Venom 2, Garfield will be revealed to be the Spider-Man of Spunk. Uh, in the, That's the Sony universe. Right. Uh, would be the Spider-Man of Spunk. Um, in post-credit, he gets sucked into the MCU due to Wanda. Uh, in future, Garfield, Spider-Man in supporting role in Spunk film. And MCU have Holland for Spider-Man 4 through 6 and Avengers films. Here's the problem with that theory, James. And listen, Rob, you know I love Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man. I know. I, I I mean, I love Tom Holland as Spider-Man, but I would really dig seeing Andrew Garfield back as Spider-Man again. But, of course, the big problem is this. Kevin Feige is not going to sign a deal that says, while we're investing millions and millions and millions into making a live-action Spider-Man, that you are also out there making live-action Spider-Man. There's no way Kevin Feige agrees to that. There's simply no, and he would have to be pretty dumb to agree to that because our Marvel movies should be the only, as long as we're spending all this money, then the only place you can see a live action Spider-Man should be in our movies that we're making and we're producing. Sony's distributing it, but that should be the only place. I just don't see any way that they agree to sign any kind of a deal where you can make live action Spider-Mans as well while we're making live action Spider-Man's. I just don't see them doing it. I don't know, Rob, is is there some kind of way to make that happen, do you think? Or do you think that's a you know a non-starter? I mean, look, it, it, the way things work today, I don't think anything is necessarily off the table. So yes, the answer is I think they could make that happen. The question is, would they? I mean, you're you're looking at economic interests. All, all of this comes down to money. You know who's getting paid, and also there are there are legal ramifications to all these things, in terms of owning characters and and how does how is the money going to be divided for years to come? So it's just a question of are they willing to put those kinds of things aside and 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 do what they need to do to hammer out these deals, or a lot of people you know get in the way of it and stand on ceremony. They want more money, and it just becomes untenable. But you know the world we live in now. We as fans and viewers, we want all this stuff to happen. And I think they know that. Like Kevin Feige knows that. He knows what people want to see and what they're going to turn out for. So it's just a question of will their corporate overlords allow them to do it? Well, you know for a fact, Rob, that sometimes what the consumers want is not necessarily good for your company. No, right. I know. I mean, so it's 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 going to be really weird, interesting, I should say, to see how they kind of navigate that as they move forward. All right, uh, Miko Suayan writes, "Hey, John, hope all is well. All is well. Thank you." Uh, the greatest irony in Hollywood history, Raya and the Last Dragon, a film about Southeast uh, Asian fantasy folklore. Disney Plus is not available in Southeast Asian countries. <laughs> Ain't that a bitch? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, but again, you know, Rob, this goes back. We as fans often forget that this is a very complex business. Do you think Disney Plus isn't available in Southeast Asia because Disney doesn't want to be available in Southeast Asia? Of course they want to be there. If they're there, they're making money. Um but it's a very, you know, all these things about territorial rights and licenses and all this kind of stuff. It, it can be very complex. It can take years. And so I, I get it. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. And I believe me, I feel for all of our fellow film and television loving brothers and sisters around the world who, you know, they hear us talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but they're living in a place that doesn't have that right now or we're talking about the new watchman series on hbo but you know they're in a territory that doesn't have that content yet it must be incredibly frustrating but give it time give it time it will come all right next up uh jake g writes uh john you should be a manager in the schmodown uh your leadership qualities would lead to certain victory rob i talked to you at schmodown spectacular four about the seahawks and i love that you called them the jedi knights of the pacific northwest <laughs> rob that is uh basically i love that nickname for the seahawks the jedi knights of the pacific where did That's you come right. up with that by the way like where did you hear that i never heard i just made it up i think i made it up on this show. That's amazing. I love the Jedi Knights of the Pacific Northwest. They should, yeah, the, I mean, the team should totally like embrace that. <laughs> the Seahawks should totally embrace that. Well, you know, it's, it's like they'd all be carrying their green lightsabers, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, I'd love to see that. Um, and uncle Pete would, of course, I'd love to see uncle Pete in a robe, like a, you know, full on Jedi Knight robe dispensing his 
Coach Carroll. Oh, I would I would love to see that. Um, <laughs> getting back to your to your original question there, Jake. Um, I, I how do I say this as tactfully as possible? Listen, first thing that I that I should mention. Oh, <laughs> Rob's already giggling. First thing I should say uh, off the top is is this. Um, I know a lot of people often speculate, and I don't know why. I I've never understood why. A lot of people will often speculate about the the nature and temperature of the relationship between me and Christian Harloff. Make no mistake about it. Christian and I get along great. Uh, Christian and I we communicate often. Um, I have done stuff behind the scenes to help schmo down at times when I could and where I could and to what degree I was able to do so. Yeah. Um, Chris and I, we are, you know, we, we were just texting not long ago. We are communicating. I actually think he might even be coming over to my house in a couple of days. Uh, I, I, I have all the respect in the world for Christian Harloff. Um, Christian was of course in my doc. Well, actually it's funny. And it's just put that in the live chat as well. I was about to say Christian was obviously, it was also in my documentary, which, uh, Anish just pointed out in the live chat as well. We get along great. And it, it is just, there has always been this thing like people try to start this thing. Oh, you know, Christian and John don't like it. Just, no, not at all. I, I think it's great. I love what Christian's doing. I like uh, Christian too. Yeah. And you know, I like we, Christian and Mark. Mark Ellis. Yeah. I mean, it's great. Um, and Ellis is fantastic, wonderful. Mark Ellis is great. Um, so I, I'm not, I don't want to go into any details except to say, because, you know, I'm, I'm always just, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I always just try to be straight. Um, but I'm also not the type of person, like, I don't believe in, um, in, making private issues or what should be private issues public and things like that. And all to say, um, but yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I, I will never go on schmo down. No. Um, and that has nothing to do with Christian. Just to be very, very clear. That's why I make, cause I knew if I just said that Rob, people instantly would be saying, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I get along with Christian. Great. I have all the respect in the world for Christian. I really, really do. Uh, but no, there, there's no way, uh, and Christian knows why, um, and it has nothing to do with Christian or anything like that, but let's just say that there are elements there that is just makes it to be something that I don't want to be a part of. And so, I mean, you, you take that for as a will, but it doesn't matter. Listen, I, uh, I think Christian is a, one of the smartest guys in the space, um, and uh, I think he's going to do great things. I think he, they are doing great things. Like him and Mark uh, continue to blow it up, and it's great. And uh, there's that. But um, yeah, I'm sorry. That's that's saying a lot of stuff without actually saying anything. But it's it, this isn't the crap that we want to talk about here anyway. But yeah. and I appreciate that you asked the question, Jake. That's as much as I'm willing to say. But there you go. Anyway, Iconic Reactions also sends in a super chat badge. Thanks for that, man. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Stubble McShave writes, uh, where do we go? There it is. Stubble McShave writes, I think there's a small chance that Marvel and Sony will re-up their deal with Holland Spider-Man and introduce a uh, Morales Spidey that's based in San Francisco. I also think there's a small chance that there will be two Spideys uh, in two Spideys in Sonyverse, one in New York and one in San Francisco. Again, the big problem with that is that I just don't see Marvel agreeing to you know, making Spider-Man movies that Sony gets to distribute while Sony goes ahead and makes their own live action Spider-Man at the same time. I think that becomes very, very problematic. Now, is it a possibility? Absolutely. Like there's nothing that makes it impossible, but there are things that make them improbable. So for that reason, Stubble, I still think that makes that kind of improbable. Yeah. Um, so there's that. All right. Next up. Um, K Major writes, my first movie going experience was 1993's Cop and a Half with Burt Reynolds. I remember that. Wow. With Burt Reynolds as my dad. <laughs> I just looked it up. It made $40 million on a $4 million budget only in the 90s. Terrible movie. Good times. You know, it's funny, Rob. I, I mean, there's probably a, that's fun. There are probably a lot of movies from that era that I'd love to look back on to see how much movie money those movies made. But I haven't thought about that one in like no. forever. I haven't thought of that in Oh God. And that was 93. It feels like it would have been older than that. It feels like that would have, that was like a mid eighties kind of, um, yeah, uh, a mid eighties kind of thing. But yeah, anyway, 
Uh, that would be <laughs> cop and a half. It's been a while, K Major, since I thought of that one. It has been a while. All right. Uh, next up, we've got Chips uh, Bewick, uh, who uh, tips in like $50. Thank you, Chips, for supporting our channel on that level, man. That's really generous of you. Thank you, man. Um, and Chips writes in, uh, thanks for your shows. Well, thank you for being part of them, Chips. Uh, been following since Collider. Since Star Wars is still profitable, why not reboot the original trilogy? We have Lucas's massive plans, better tech, plus our beloved Mark Hamill is still with us, Vader, Obi-Wan. Well, listen, I'll be honest with you. And again, by the way, Chip, thank you again for supporting our channel on that level, man. Seriously, that's really generous of you. Um, listen, Rob, I've said this before. Whenever I say that I'm all for reboots, because if you make a great movie, great, we have a new great movie. If you make a bad movie, oh, well, we still got the original, no big deal. It doesn't matter. There's no drawback, in my opinion, to making a reboot. And people always come back to me, oh, yeah, you say that, but you wouldn't be okay if they made a Star Wars reboot. Actually, I would. Come I'm, on. And, you know, I, I'm i fine if they want to do it. I mean, it's not what I would do. If, if they asked me if I think they should do it, I'd say no. But if they wanted to do it, hey, if they're good, they're good. And if they're not good, we still have the original and we'll instantly forget about the new one. It happens all the time. But why would you do that here? Like, yeah, what's, I don't know. <laughs> like, Star Wars is ongoing. They just made, you know, three or four billion dollar films. They've, there's just no reason to go back and do that. And then the cheap novelty of having Mark Hamill back, but only now Mark Hamill is playing Vader or something. I, I don't know that. Cause to me, if you're going to reboot, like I've always believed this, Rob, if you're going to reboot, reboot, I've always said the only two exceptions. And I said this long before either happened. You can go back and watch us long before either happened all the way back in the AMC days. I've always said that I have two exceptions. James Earl Jones doing Mufasa, which they then eventually did or JK Simmons back as J. Jonah James. And I said, those are the only two things. Other than that, you re if you're rebooting, truly reboot. Truly go with a clean slate and relaunch the thing. But the thing is, Star Wars is an ongoing thing right now. And they have some really good things happening, like with Mandalorian, and we've got like the Acolyte coming, and we've got Rogue Squadron coming, and we've got the Obi-Wan series coming. You reboot the originals, you now destroy all the good ongoing stuff that you have. So... Well, I'm totally cool if Disney decides we're stopping everything on the Star Wars stuff we're doing and we're restarting with a reboot of the original trilogy. I right. wouldn't necessarily think that's a great decision, but I'm okay with it if they wanted to do it. But I know, Rob, what do you think about the chances of them just like rebooting the original trilogy? Like, it's, <clears> obviously <throat> we can't say ever, but I mean like within the next six years, what do you think of the chances of them I like just rebooting the trilogy in the next six years? I, I don't think that's ever going to happen because the, they've got too many peripheral things going on with it. You know, you've, you've got all these tie in characters. I mean, Cassie and Andor ties into rogue one, which ties into the original series. So or the original trilogy. So they're not going to change that. They're not going to go back and retell. I mean, they might tell stories in that era that maybe retcon things or illuminate areas of the universe we have yet to really truly understand but they're not going to go back and remake star wars that would be ridiculous especially mm -hmm. because all of these things the mandalorian has mark hamill coming back being dh playing luke skywalker they're not gonna they're not gonna change that around because then all of what they're building would have to would suffer and yeah. they're building off all of that i mean they're, they're doing all of this construction based on what George Lucas has done, whether it's the Clone Wars, whether it's the Bad Batch, whether it's the Mandalorian, whether it's Cassie and Andor, whether it's the Book of Boba Fett. All of that is all coming out of the original trilogy. So to change the original trilogy would mean that all of those plans would be sort of torpedoed. What would you yeah. do? Can you imagine? No, we're not going to have Eck. We're going to redo Star Wars, but we're not going to have the Death Star is going to be a cube like the Borg. <laughs> I mean, it's like. You, it, it, I think of all the things that I've ever seen in entertainment, the one thing I'm pretty secure in my life that it's never going to be remade is the original Star Wars and Empire and Jedi. No one's going to remake those. The original trilogy. The original yeah, the trilogy. Original trilogy. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think they will either. I don't think they will. I don't think they should. But I, I'm just saying in advance, I, I'm okay theoretically if they wanted to do it. Because if they did and it was terrible, 
we still have the original trilogy and I'm okay. Hey, Rob, speaking of we're doing okay, thank you for making today a better day for me, considering I'm still on a rager uh, after the whole Maple Leaf debacle. (laughs) Oh, during this show, I tweeted something specially for you, John. Oh, of course you did, you son of a bitch. I Um, tweeted it. I you're going to love it. That that's the new logo for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Get rid of the iconic blue leaf. The new the new logo for the Toronto Maple Leafs is <laughs> freaking Toronto Maple Leafs. My whole freaking life. Anyway, Robert Meyer Burnett has been here, ladies and gentlemen. Rob, thanks for spending your time with us here today. We'll see you again tomorrow. But in the meantime, where can people follow you and all of your glory and goodness online? Uh, you can find me on an Instagram at Robert Meyer Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM, or find me on. My own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. All right, man. Thanks for spending some of your time here today. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Have a good one. See you. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and the only, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Good to have him here. And it's good to have you guys here. We still have some time, so let's keep going through your live questions here, guys. Uh, moving on now here. That was Chip uh, Bellick writes. Uh, Skylar Hillman writes. One of two. Hey, John and Rob, just missed Rob. Uh, Did you see that the actor who played Terry Silver in Karate Kid 3 is reprising his role? I have enjoyed all three seasons of Cobra Kai and looking forward to season four. I love the 80s nostalgia. Have you ever watched the How It Should Have... Oh, these are two separate questions. Okay, so let's go through first one. By the way, Iconic Reaction sends in a Super Chat badge in the live chat. And I think mm, R also sent in a Super Chat badge a little bit earlier as well. So thanks, guys, for sending that in. Um, Let's start with question one. I don't watch... Uh, Cobra Kai. I was very excited about the idea of the show. I loved their notion for it. I love that they were bringing it back, that they were going to tell it from Johnny's point of view. I thought that was great, but I watched three or four episodes and it just wasn't for me. I'm not crapping on it. I'm just simply saying I gave it a shot. Wasn't for me. Did not work for me. My wife loved it. My wife loves it. But so after those first like three or four episodes, I kind of ditched on it. So I... I don't really care. Plus, I thought that was the worst Karate Kid movie that he was in. I thought that was the worst one. Yes, I even thought the one with, uh, what's her name? Academy Award winning actress uh, who kind of took over Daniel's role in the Karate Kid movie. Which one was it? The Next Karate Kid? Is that what it was called? Is that what it was called, guys? The Next Karate Kid? Anyway, um, I even thought that one was better than the one that this dude was in. Hillary Swank. Thank you. Uh, a Aaron uh, sends in. It was Hillary Swank. That's right. Who was the next karate kid. I even like that one better. So uh, not really interested in this because I don't watch Cobra Kai, but again, my wife and several of my friends love it. Absolutely. Cause it does work for them. Um, but it also wouldn't excite me even if I was watching Cobra Kai. Cause I thought that was the worst of the karate kid movies, but that's just me. That's just me. All right. Thanks for sending that in Skylar. Appreciate that. Uh, next up. An anonymous viewer writes, uh, Hey, John, been watching since the beginning of WandaVision. Oh, cool, man. You're a recent addition around here. Thanks for being here. I was looking for channels who were talking about it and found yours. Wasn't able to ask during its run, didn't have the funds, but what are some of your favorite sitcoms if you have any? Well, I mean, some of my favorite sitcoms are ones that, you know, you'll hear me talk about a lot. Like, obviously, there's your all-time greats that are up there in the discussion for the greatest sitcoms of all time. Seinfeld, The Office, Um, those two are like probably the de facto bar sets for some of the greatest sitcoms of all time. Some of the other ones that I like to have in there as well are Parks and Rec. You guys know I love Parks and Rec so much. Um, I was a massive, massive fan back in the day of this little... NBC comedy I think it lasted like four or five seasons I can't remember called Wings I don't know if any of the rest of you guys uh, ever saw Wings or ever watched that show uh, Wings it had the dude from uh, the guy who was Master Splinter did the voice of Master Splinter in the Teenage Mut- the recent Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie at Thomas Hayden Church uh, was in it as well I really really liked Wings uh, that was right up there for me. Not a lot of people watch it, but that was one of my sleepers. I, you know, I'd have to give it a lot more thought, but yeah, the office parks and rec Seinfeld, uh, these are the ones that to me 
uh, really stand uh, stand out. All right, uh, let's get back over there. Uh, Skylar Hyman's second part of his question wrote, have you watched uh, the How It Should Have Ended before? They should make a recap of the first three seasons of Cobra Kai with a funny scene where Johnny yells quiet and the monster from A Quiet Place 2 comes and kills him. Well, listen, I, we, I've mentioned How It Should Have Ended multiple times on my show. I really do like the How It Should... They're not always great. Like... Some of my favorite um, spoof, like there have been some big movie spoof things online, right? Like obviously there was the Honest Trailers, which I haven't really kept up with at all in a while, but there was Honest Trailers. That was a big one. Um, One that is, I just find consistently funny is the pitch meetings that I can't remember the name of the comedian dude, the guy that does them, but Ryan something or other. Um the pitch meetings are always good. The how it should have ended, they were always good for a while. Now, they're a little hit and miss. Sometimes they kill it. They still kill it. They can still be on. I'll still watch every single one that comes out. Uh, I They're not as consistently good as, say, the pitch meeting ones are, but they are still quite good. Again, I haven't, I haven't watched anything about Cobra Kai past season or past episodes three or four, so... Uh, I can't write. By the way, uh, Ryan's name is Ryan George. Thank you, Dragon Ten and Amy and Cinema Sketch and others in there who wrote that in. Yes, uh, he does these pitch meetings and they're really, really good. All right. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Willow, and Willow writes. Uh, you were just complaining about the Leafs. Yes, I was. Uh, imagine, though, if they made it to the finals, won the first three games, only to choke and lose four times in a row to lose the Stanley Cup. That's what happened to my Canucks in 2011, and I'm still heartbroken. I get it, Willow. I get it. But your team at least went to the Stanley Cup finals. My team, the Toronto Maple Laughs, have not made it to the finals, not even been in the finals the entire time I have been alive on this earth. 2011? I talk about the early 70s. As long as I've been alive, the Toronto Maple Leafs have not been to the Stanley Cup finals. They haven't won a single playoff series in 17 years. You want to talk about a drought? They hurt my soul. The Toronto Maple Leafs make my heart sad. All right? Finally, up three games to one against your age-old biggest rival, the Montreal Canadiens. You are favored by a mile. You're up three games to one. You're going to win your first series in 17 years. You've got a good enough team that a lot of people say could potentially go to the Stanley Cup Finals for the first time in my lifetime, and you... That's the new... Go ahead. I give you permission, Toronto Maple Leafs. Take a screen capture right now. There. Take my face and make that the new logo on your jerseys. You go ahead. Am I a little bitter about this? Yes. Because finally, for the first time in like 20 years, I actually felt some hope in the Maple Leafs. Up 3-1. to one. First series win in 17 years, everybody. Woo! And... Ugh. Son of a bitch! Sorry. They hurt me. They hurt me, ladies and gentlemen. They made my heart sad. They make me cry. I'm, I'm so angry and hateful and bitter towards them right now. Okay, anyway, suck it up. Let's go on to it here. Uh, Next up, we've got Gabriel Ray who writes, Sony and Disney signed a deal for one more Spider-Man movie and for Spider-Man to be, sorry, Sony and Disney signed a deal for one more Spider-Man movie and for Spider-Man to be in one more Marvel movie. And since WandaVision and Spider-Man No Way Home lead into Doctor Strange 2, over under 35% that Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness is that second film. Oh yeah, listen, so the deal that they currently have in place, Gabriel, is, you're right, they have one more movie left. One more Spider-Man movie left, and that is Spider-Man No Way Home. And then they have one more contractual obligation for Tom... Tom Holland to appear as Spider-Man in a separate, different film. And I think we all know that's going to be Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness. I don't think that's official, so maybe he's not, but I think we all know he's going to be in there. At least I think so. And that'll probably be the one last thing. And then theoretically speaking, that's it. 
their contractual obligations, Sony and Marvel's contractual obligations with each other are then over. And Sony is then free to take Spider-Man back and put him in their Spideyverse over at Sony and take him out of the MCU unless a new deal is signed, which is one of the big possibilities. So we'll see how that goes, man. We will see how that goes. Thanks for writing that in, Gabriel. Appreciate that, man. All right, next up. Uh, Guy Fox JLT writes, uh, Hey, John, Samsung canceled the Note series a few months ago. I want to know, well, what is your next phone? Well, a lot of the industry analysts I've talked to, I don't have my phone here right now because my current daily driver that I use is the Samsung Note 20 Ultra. Uh, I love this phone. The Sony Note 20 Ultra is a crazy good phone. And not everybody uses the S Pen that comes with it. But if once you get the hang of using the S Pen, there's a lot of things you can do with your phone. I love it. I think it's a, I know my wife works for Apple. I think it's a superior phone to anything Apple produces. Just saying. All right. I've heard a lot of analysts in the industry saying Samsung is not done with the notes line. I think they're going to do, they will do more notes in the future, but that's aside. What is my next phone? Sigh, I actually think my next phone might be an iPhone. And here for only one reason, because I think the Samsung phones, particularly their flagship phones, are the superior phone. I, I say that as somebody who used to use iPhone. I say that as somebody who is a very happy iPad user. My main laptop is a MacBook Air. Uh, my main desktop PC is a PC, but I have a lot of Mac products. But as somebody who has been an iPhone user, I have just simply found that the flagship level Samsung phones are superior. That said, uh, that said, I have always known of this functionality that Apple has called AirDrop. And it is such a simple concept, but it works so well. And you have to understand, I shoot a lot of video at my phone, whether it's my right out of the theater reviews or my backyard companion videos or thoughts on walks or whatever. And part of the big struggle is in the pain in the ass of getting that footage because it's usually gigabytes of data and getting that footage from one thing to another. And, you know, Anne shot my most recent uh, my most recent straight out of the theater review with her phone. And then, oh, uh, let me let me get you this card so you can transfer it to this. She goes, oh, no, just open up your MacBook. Here, I'll, I'll airdrop this video to you. It's like three gigabytes. Boom, boom, there it's on my uh, iPad. And I'm like, oh my God, that was so fast. That was so fast and seamless and all that kind of stuff. And when you transfer files as much as I do, that becomes very attractive. So I think there might be a possibility that I might make my next phone an iPhone. Because I love my Apple iPads for my tablets. I use iPad Pro. Love my iPad Pro. My iPad Pro is my favorite computing device that I own. But I really like Android phones. But I think I might have to, at least for one more phone, maybe for one phone, my next phone might be an iPhone. Just so I can take advantage of that airdrop a little bit easier between my various devices and Anne's. But I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. I'll, I will keep you updated. I will keep you updated about uh, what my next phone actually ends up beating. Because I'm getting close to the time where I'm going to have to get it. All right. Great Grabthar's Hammer writes. John, I don't know if you realize this. When somebody brought up Mortal Kombat theme about being inspired by a Scandinavian church song, uh, you missed the pun. It's based on a Finnish hymn, oh, as in Finnish hymn. Yeah, I had a few people write that to me. Listen, I, I don't care. Uh, I am so focused on, you guys have no idea how difficult it is to run audio and video and a live stream and engage with questions and try to stay on track and do it all live, no cutting, no editing. So I'm really, really just zoom, like focused on, on trying to get through the question, whatever. If somebody wants to send in a pun or something like that, yeah, I will probably miss it because I'm not looking for it. I am looking to answer people's questions, you know, because people like to send in these live chat questions, people support the channel by, by putting a tip attached to it. And so with people supporting the channel by putting a tip attached to it 
you know, as long as it's appropriate for the show, I am focused in on trying to give them the best answer that I possibly can. And so if they want to slip in a little pun like that, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Just don't get upset if I completely overlook it because it's not what I'm looking for when I'm kind of trying to zero in and focus on and getting the, uh, the questions. And so I don't mind that he wrote that in. I have no problem with that. Just you got to understand if you want to try to do that, it's the joke you wrote in is probably going to be missed because I'm just looking to answer your question as best as I can. And I may not pick up on it, but that's just that. All right. Uh, next up. Um, let's see. Where are we at here next? The next up is Mr. Cross writes, uh, one of two to my fellow film fan who asked about a new, about new workout songs. I've got some to add to your playlist. Because somebody wrote in the other day, say, Hey, I'm starting to work out. What pieces of music should I listen to? And he writes in, I've got some to add to your playlist. Uh, Anthropody, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, it ain't over till the Wasp Lady stings. That's from the Ant Man's uh, Ant Man of the Wasp uh, portals. The main Avengers theme, Captain America, um, uh, two of two, taking a stand from the Winter Soldier, and finally, what's up, Danger from Spider Verse. I actually love that song. Like everybody talks about that. Uh, I I can't remember the artist that does that. You know, everybody, when they think about Spider-Man uh, into the Spider-Verse, they think of that song. Me, when I think of Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse's soundtrack, I think of What's Up Danger. I love that song. That song is awesome. Anyway, from Spider-Verse. Uh, these, of course, in addition to Robin John's recommendations, bonus, Hearts on Fire from Rocky Four. Hearts on Fire. Um, Rocky Four, I hope it's used for a training montage in Thor 4. All right, thanks for some of those recommendations, Mr. Cross. Appreciate that, man. All right, next up, Paul Starguy writes, one of three. Uh, early movie memories. The first movie I saw was The Sound of Music in 1965 when I was five. I especially remember the opening where Julie Andrews runs across the meadow singing, The Hills Are Alive with the Sound of Music. My mother told me I once yelled out, Hurry up, God, in the middle of a Bible movie. <laughs> <laughs> probably greatest story ever told 1965 or the Bible in the beginning in 1966. I vividly remember Lot's wife being turned into a pillar of salt. Also saw the original planet of the apes. I remember uh, very well the iconic scene at the end uh, with the Statue of Liberty. One of the first movies I saw on my own with a friend was 2001 A Space Odyssey. We found it very confusing. Oh, listen, Paul, there are people today who watch 2001 A Space Odyssey and find it very confusing frustratingly ass confusing. So don't feel bad about that. There are people today who have seen 2001 a space odyssey 10 times and still find it confusing. But I want to jump back to the one you mentioned there about planet of the apes, because I know there were others, but to me, I mean, obviously you also got citizen Kane with Rosebud. I mean, obviously yes. And there are, there are others, but when I think about, like the original big twist. The one that stands out to me the most is that one in Planet of the Apes. Now, none of us feel the impact of it anymore because the movie is so old and we're so familiar with it. But you got to think of that time. You're watching this movie, Planet of the Apes, and we all know the ending now, so, so none of us can watch it clean. But try to go back to that era. And that movie's going on and that movie's happening and you got Charlton Heston doing his thing. And then you come to the end and Charlton Heston is on that beach. And he looks up and he sees what we recognize instantly as the Statue of Liberty. And we realize he has been on Earth the whole time. That, to me, stands as one of the most iconic classic and twists ever. I mean, Rosebud isn't really a twist. That's just a big reveal. It's not really a twist. It didn't change your perception of the whole movie. Whereas Charlton Heston finds that Statue of Liberty and it instantly changes your complete perception of the entire film. You're now going back through every scene in your head and now you're looking at it through a completely different context than what you did when the movie started. It is so iconic and so brilliant, and that's why a lot of people still talk about that today. Hey, Paul, listen, man, thanks for sharing, taking us down that little memory journey of yours, talking about some of your original films you went to go see. I appreciate that, man. Thanks for sending that in. All right, next up, 
We got the Saw who writes, just watched Army of the Dead. Really didn't need to be that long. Uh, but that ending, man, uh, so goddamn unsatisfying. Uh, you know what was satisfying, though? That scene where he cracks open the safe with that music. Almost as good as a really good climax. I liked it, too. Although I will say this. One of my criticisms of Army of the Dead coming out, and I said this right away, because I came out of it and said, hey, thumbs up from me. Had fun with it. It's a, it's a, As far as a zombie film goes, fun, classic kind of zombie film. It's a lot of fun. I had some criticisms of it, for sure. One of which was it was unnecessarily long. That movie didn't need to be that long. Like, when you go into A Quiet Place 2, and John Krasinski cracks that thing at like an hour and 35 minutes, perfect. Perfect. It kept it tight. It kept the story moving. You never felt a lag. It had crisp pace. It was great. Army of the Dead did not be, need to be as long as it was. There's a lot of stuff you could have cut out of that. But the crack safing scene is great because we were talking just recently about the whole um, Ryan George's pitch meeting videos. And Ryan George, in his pitch meeting video for Army of the Dead, makes a tremendous observation that I never thought about. Tremendous observation that I never thought about, which was part of the team that they send in is a safe cracker. But doesn't that dude own the casino? Would he not have access to the combination code of the safe? Why do they need a safe cracker? Well, because it'll make it fun in the movie, as they say in, in the thing. And that that's, yeah, so the safe cracking scene, I actually like the safe cracking scene. I think that's fun. But then when I do look back at it, I was like, yeah, that makes no sense. Why the hell? Because if I was sending you to my house to get something for me, you don't have to crack the combination code on my keypad on my front door to get in. I will tell you the combination code. If you're going to my house to get something for me, I'm not going to make you break into my house. I'm going to give you the code to my house. Uh, so that that part was, uh, yeah, a little bit too long. And even though I still like that vault safe, uh, that vault cracking scene, it, it probably doesn't make any sense. So there's that, whatever. Uh, all right, thanks for that, the sock. All right, next up. Uh, Ryan Lohner, and this will be the last couple of ones we take today, guys. Ryan Lohner writes in, well, I finally worked up the guts to see for myself just what's so bad about Highlander 2, The Quickening. And now that I have seen it, what most comes to mind is that I have to imagine that there were a ton of ideas for what to do with the Highlander sequel. And if this was really what the studio thought was the best one, I have to know what some of the others were. Still, I'll forever be thankful for the image of Sean Connery saying in genuine confusion, what's a shithead? Yeah, man. Listen, uh, the Highlander is such an interesting series of movies for me. Because as many of you know, the original Highlander, um, the original Highlander is in my top 10 all time greatest movies. It's the one movie on my top 10 list because everybody, well, my, not everybody has my same top 10 list, but all the movies on my top 10 list, people will go, oh yeah, that's a good one. And that's a good one. Even if it's not on their list, but the one movie that always makes people scratch their heads when I list it in my top 10 favorite of all time is that original Christopher Lambert, Clancy Brown, Sean Connery, Queen music-inspired Highlander. That, to me, is the top 10 my, of my all-time favorite movies. Highlander 2 is literally a part of the trinity of the all-time worst movies ever made. To me, the trinity of the all-time worst big Hollywood wide-release movies ever made are, in no particular order, Battlefield Earth, Catwoman, and The Highlander Part 2. So I've got the first Highlander in my top 10 all-time favorite. Highlander Part 2 is literally one of the three, in my opinion, worst big Hollywood wide-release movies ever made in cinematic history. So I do have this kind of mixed, mixed bag, right? But I'm very excited that they're remaking this new one. And Henry Cavill is going to be the new Connor McLeod. I'm very, very excited about that. Very, very excited about that. All right, guys, listen. We still have more questions to go from uh, Tim Platt, um, LaBelle, uh, Katanimi, uh, Price, uh, and so on and so forth. Do not worry. I'm going to do a companion video a little bit later today. I might even do it live. 
I might pre-record it. I might do it live. I don't know. You'll have to just wait and see how I do it. But we will do a companion video a little bit later today where we will get through all the remaining questions that were sent in today uh, by the time right now we end this show. So if your question didn't get read yet, don't worry. Companion video a little bit later today. We'll get to all the rest of your questions. But for now, that'll do it for me, guys, for this installment of The John Campia Show. Thank you so much for being here and making this show a part of your day. Thanks to Robert Meyer Burnett for bringing his glorious glory and goodness. And a special thank you to all of you guys who sent in these live comments and questions. First of all, because you give us great fun things to talk about. But secondly, you support this channel as you do it. And all of us here involved with The John Campia Show are very, very grateful for all of your guys' support. All right, guys. That'll do it for me. Remember to do the four main things. Stay smart, stay safe, take care of yourselves. Please take care of the people around you. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends.